Well, I trust you've uh, had a good afternoon and maybe even gotten a nap in. And uh, we appreciate very much the chance to be with you tonight. And uh, this is obviously a wonderful opportunity to sing praise. And we've done it well today with tremendous song selections and song direction. And uh, thank you very, very much for that. Now, can you give me the names of the people who have died in the United States from the coronavirus? Do you know their names? Could you give me the name of even one? Perhaps, perhaps not. Generally speaking, we know a general number, but we don't really identify with the names of those who've died. Now, there are many individuals who have died for me in, and for you in battle for this country across the years and purchasing our freedom. Can I tell you the names of all the soldiers who've shed blood on the battlefield for you and for me? I cannot. I don't know their names. I do know this, that there are many people who've died, of course, since this world began. And we asked this morning, how many people have lived upon the planet Earth? And of course, we could also ask the question, how many deaths have there been on the planet Earth? And then this question, which death is the most significant death that has ever taken place? And for some of us, it's the death of the loved one that we cherish the most. But you know, that may not make national news and it may not touch anyone overseas, but there is someone who died who actually died for all men. He tasted death for every man, according to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. And tonight I want to discuss with you this individual, Jesus Christ. As we explore the power of his death, I ask the question tonight, what is it that makes his death so very powerful? And the reading that was done so well in your hearing just a moment ago spotlights the first reason. The first reason why the death of Christ is so powerful is because of the person who hung upon that cross. And you will observe that it is not Moses who's hanging upon the cross. And I don't know if this is is if it's showing up behind me or not, but I'm just going to preach as if it is, and you can imagine it in your mind. And uh, if it's not, that'll be just fine. I, I want you to know that as you and I think about the power of, of Jesus Christ and the life that he lived, he is the one and only person who could hang upon a Roman cross for you and for me. But he's not the only person that ever died on a Roman cross, is he? Is Jesus Christ the only one who ever died for you and for me on a cross? No. He's the only one that died for you or for me, that's for sure. But he's not the only one that ever died on a Roman cross. What makes his death so powerful? It's the person who died there and the nature of that person. Notice it's not Moses on the cross because he was not sinless. He needed someone to save him from his sins. Isaiah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets could not hang on the cross. The only one who could is Jesus Christ. Do you know what Hebrews 4.15 says? He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet what? Without sin. He didn't even sin one time, as we pointed out in the message this morning. His matchless life is described in Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. And you can notice there that there's a contrast made between those high priests under the Old Testament system and our sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Now watch, he doesn't need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. He didn't have any sins to atone for, and that is why he can atone for yours and for mine. Because Jesus lived a life like no one else has ever lived, he could die a death like no one else has ever died. Jesus Christ died as a perfect sacrifice. In fact, the Bible says he is described in Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 as holy, harmless, undefiled, 
separate from sinners. Now, what if we start categorizing the people here tonight and we say, okay, we're going to make this group over here those who've never sinned. And I'm sure we have some small, unaccountable individuals here tonight. And we could put them in a group and say, all right, here are the folks who've never sinned. Then again, there are those of us in this room tonight who have sinned, and yet we've been forgiven of our sins by the blood of Christ. There may be others here tonight, for all I know, who sinned but have never received the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Whatever the case, I hope and pray, dear friends, that you will find that cleansing before it is everlastingly too late. Jesus Christ died as a sinless person so you could be forgiven of your sins. And notice that this person hanging on the cross was sufficient, as I noted. There's no one you respect or I respect that could die there in his place and take his place because he is the one and only. Hebrews 9.12, look at the language that is used here in Hebrews chapter 9.12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. One time is all it took. Now, I know those Old Testament sacrifices were offered year by year continually, according to the first part of Hebrews 10, but Jesus Christ is different. Look at the language of Hebrews 10, 10 and following. It says that we are sanctified by that one offering of Jesus Christ, and then it gave this illustration. Every priest standeth, keeps on standing daily, ministering oftentimes the same sacrifice as, plural, which can never take away sins, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, what's the Bible say? Sat. They're standing in an officiating position and they're continually standing in that officiating position of the Old Testament because they're not done. They're going to have to do this again next year and the year after that and so on and so forth. Because the blood of bulls and goats, it's impossible that it could take away sins, Hebrews 10.4. But the blood of Jesus Christ, oh indeed, it's sufficient for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, Hebrews 10 and verse number 14. He is a sufficient person, and his blood is sufficient to cleanse. Have you ever had a garment that you really, really, really loved, and you got stained? And you wash it hoping that the stain will be completely obliterated so that no one will notice it when you're wearing that garment? And you wash it, and the stain fades a bit, but it's still so prominent that you know if you wear this, people are going to see it. It's going to be distracting. So you try to wash it again. You might apply a different detergent, shout it out, whatever you try. You might try, and it may still not go away completely, but I've got good news for you and for me tonight. The blood of Jesus Christ, when it washes your sins away, how much of a remnant, how much of a stain does it leave behind? Now, I'm not suggesting there aren't consequences that still exist after some of our sinful behavior, but I'm telling you that as far as guilt is concerned, I love that song that we just sang in Christ Alone, and it talks about no guilt in life. How great is it to look in the mirror and even though you've, you know that academically you know I did things that are contrary to the will of God, but if you were to ask him about it, he would say, I've obliterated that from my record. I'll blot out their iniquities and remember them when? No more, says God. And so what a blessing, what a great thing that is to know that Jesus can wash my sins away completely. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus is sufficient to do that. But then notice, the person who hangs there is sufficient, and he's also substitutionary. I want you to go back in time to the time of Abram. Abram's 75 years old, and God says, Abram, you're going to have a child, and you're going to have that child be the one through whom the seed promise will be perpetuated. Abram waits 25 years almost 
before Isaac ever arrives. And then Isaac arrives and Abram's Abraham now, as he's called, is told, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, into the land of Moriah and there sacrifice him. Now, how hard must that have been? I've waited 25 years to get him. He now grows up to this age and now I'm supposed to kill him? How can the seed promise go on if I kill him? Abraham had accounted that God was able to raise him from the dead, which is astonishing when you consider the fact how many recorded resurrections from the dead do we read about in Genesis 1 to 21? How many recorded resurrections from the dead are there? There aren't any. So can you tell me how Abraham knew God was capable of raising a man from the dead when he'd never known of that to be done, never read of it to be done, because he spelled his God with a capital G? And if God can make the world and make man out of the dust of the earth, then he can raise a man from the dead after he's died. And Abraham believed that. But you know it never got that far. Abraham was ready to take it as far as God allowed it to go but before Abraham could plunge the instrument of death into his son, there is a voice that says, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am. Lay not your hand upon the lad. I know. He said, I know that you fear me. You've not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And so he says, I know you fear me. I want you to stop and consider the fact that on this occasion, Jesus Christ was anticipated because that ram that was caught in a thicket by its horns on that occasion in Genesis 22 was offered, the language says, in the stead of his son. But Jesus Christ was offered up in your stead and mine as a substitutionary sacrifice. In fact, did you hear the reading that was done, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, as you'll notice it there, the Bible says, for Christ, not Moses, for Christ also has once suffered for sins, now watch this, the just for the unjust. Jesus Christ is the just one dying for us unjust ones, and how grateful I am. He died as a substitute for me. I read a story years ago that touched my heart, and maybe you've heard it or read about it in some place. I'm not the world's most organized person when it comes to filing things, and so I can't walk to my filing cabinet and pull this out of my files, though it's in there somewhere. But I read about this man who was constantly, constantly being asked by his young son, Daddy, can I please go to work with you? And the daddy says, no, son, you... You just can't. Uh, I, my job's too important, and I just can't risk being distracted. Uh, the boy is so small, and the father loves him, but it's his job to lower the bridge for the trains to cross, but also then to remember to raise that bridge for the barges to pass through. And so he has to focus and concentrate. But he's done this for some time now. He thinks he's got it down to a science. I mean, it's second nature to him. He almost knows what time it is before he even looks at his watch. So on this occasion, his son requests to go to work with him. His dad says, yep. They take the picnic basket, the blanket, lay it beneath the control tower. They enjoy their lunch. They wrestle. They have the time of their lives. And then all of a sudden, the whistle blows in the distance. And the, the father jolts up and says, what time is it? And he can't believe what time it's gotten to be. And he knows that whistle means that train is fast approaching. And so he tells his son, you stay right here and don't you move. Don't you move. I'm going to go up and I'll be right back down. He's going to go up and push the button that will start the massive gears in motion that will lower that bridge and make it ready for the train to cross. Those arms of the bridge are upright. If they stay in that condition, the train smashes headlong into those arms and then goes crashing into the water below. Hundreds perhaps will die, dozens for sure. And so the father is 
raced up to push the button to start this whole process, thinking, I know there's still enough time if I can, if I can just push that button. And so he's ready to push it when to his horror he sees that his son has been fascinated by this little building that's off just adjacent to the tower. There's a little opening in that building and the son is small enough to wriggle through it and the father watches him do it and knows he's now in the very area where the housing, the gears are housed for this particular operation and if I continue then he's likely to be mangled in the gears and injured to the point of death. If I don't continue, I've got all these innocent lives are about to plunge into the water below to their death through no fault of their own. And so now he's got a choice. He knows from experience I don't have time to rush down, extricate my son, get back up here, push the button, and have this lowered on time. I've got to mash this button now or it's not going to be in time. What would you do, Dad? He pushes the button, he runs, barely touches the stairs of the tower as he goes down. He hurries to the building, extricates his keys, opens the door, and is horrified to find his son's tiny, mangled, bleeding body, which he holds up as the train safely crosses. And he holds the son up in the air as if to say, do you see what I just sacrificed for you? I substituted his life for yours. If, if I had chosen to keep him alive, you wouldn't be crossing this bridge right now and sipping your tea and reading your paper and magazine and carrying on your conversations. Do you see what I've given up for you? But you know where this story breaks down? In this story, the reason the son had to die or was faced with the possibility of dying is because the father messed up. And in the case of the cross, it's not the father's fault that the son was put in the position of dying. Guess who that falls on? Starting behind me and coming forward. Guess whose fault it is that Jesus had to bleed and suffer and die? That's my fault. I am the unjust one that the just one died for. He was my substitute. And I'm so thankful that he was willing to submit. He's a submissive person. When you read the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, and you saw the song we sang, In Gethsemane Alone, there he is. He's praying. He's fervently beckoning God, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And someone might say, you say that as if he were sobbing when he said it. I want you to go to the book of Hebrews in your Bible, if you will, please. Notice chapter 5. This isn't my word. It's the word of the inspired writer. Hebrews chapter 5, and zoom in on verse 7. We are reminded that Jesus lived in a fleshly body, and in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, would you note the language, the descriptive language how did Jesus offer up prayers and supplications unto him that was able to save him from death? How did he offer up those supplications? With strong crying, not just crying, strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. What is the hardest you've ever cried? Can you remember answering the telephone and saying hello and then there's a voice on the other end and they're saying something but you can't make out what they're saying exactly because they're sobbing. They're just crying so hard you can't make out the words that they're trying to say. 
My friends, Jesus Christ in the garden, according to Hebrews 5, 7, at the very time he made those supplications unto him that was able to save him from death, at the very time he made those supplications, he did it with strong crying and tears. Can you see him in the garden with his body shaking and him sobbing and crying? And this is before they ever get him to Calvary. This is before he's scourged. It's before any of the other torture. He's losing blood even then because according to Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke talks about the suffering of Jesus Christ and we'll call it the pain. What is it that Jesus Christ experienced that made his death so powerful? He as the person on that cross experienced the pain. It was a painful sacrifice. I want you to notice that in John 19, 1, we find a very simple matter-of-fact statement. Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. That's all it says. I heard a preacher say, and I think he meant well, but I don't know that he really thought through his statement. He said this. There is no reason for us to go through a description of a scourging. If that were so important to God, he would have put it in the Bible. He didn't put it in the Bible, and therefore there's no real reason to spend any time describing a scourging, or else God would have put it in there. May I lovingly remind all of us here tonight that the readers of the first century writings did not need someone to tell them blow by blow what was involved in a scourging. They knew full well what was involved in that because of the culture in which they lived. And so no one had to describe it to them. It would have seemed odd to describe to them what they full well knew. But you and I have not grown up in a scourging culture. And so we need a little help. And it's astonishing to me how the spoken word can make an imprint on the mind that lasts for decades I mentioned the power of one hour of Bible study in the Bible class today and the power of one gospel sermon in one hour in Noblesville, Indiana years ago when I was a teenage boy, over 40 years ago now, V.P. Black, the preacher, and what an impact he made on my life in that meeting, both with his spoken word and in his signed sermon outline books that he gifted to me as a young preacher boy just trying to, to get started. And I sat there mesmerized by his preaching, and I can still recall exact phraseology that he used that night. I can tell you that as he described the scourging, he talked about them taking our Lord and tying his hands above his head and fastening him to a post, thus a whipping post. And the soldier steps forward with the whip embedded, most likely historically at the time, with bone and stone, so that when the soldier would bring it down upon the back of our Lord, it would lacerate his skin until, and this is the phraseology I'm talking about, that's never left me. There's probably not a Lord's Supper that comes to me that I don't at least revisit some of these very phrases to talk about both the cross and the events leading up to the cross as well. They beat him until, quote, his skin was hanging in long ribbons of flesh and his shoulder blades looked like white caps in a sea of blood. And with every blow, his flesh did quiver, his muscles did mutilate, his tissues did tear. This isn't even Calvary yet. They haven't driven a nail in him yet. But all oh, the suffering of a scourging. They would sometimes scourge someone so much that it would remove their outer layer of skin and muscle and the lungs would be exposed. It was a horrible, horrible way to get prepared for another horrible, horrible way to die, and that's the cross. Some scourging victims would lose so much blood, they would die before the cross. They didn't want that to happen, but sometimes it did. Here's Jesus. They put his garment back on him. Oh, you know, you're a, you're a king, are you? Well, I want you to notice, if you will, please, 
among other things that happened that were painful for Jesus, there is the slapping and the smiting. I know that I'm not the first preacher, and I hope I won't be the last preacher to describe these things to you. Uh, is there anyone here tonight that would say, Preacher, I've already heard this kind of stuff before. I don't think I need to hear it again, and uh, I don't ever want to hear it again. Look, I don't enjoy preaching it, but I never have gotten to the point where I think I don't need to be thinking about this. In Matthew 26, 67 and 68, I want you to see the language of Scripture here. Matthew 26, 67 and 68, what did they do to Jesus Christ? Verse 67, then did they spit in his face and buffeted him. That is, they beat him. Others smote or beat him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now let this sink in. To try to put it in perspective, what if we took even one person here tonight, and obviously we wouldn't, but what if we did, just for illustration purposes, we grabbed one person in this assembly tonight, blindfolded them, and then after services, we all take turns walking up to them, hauling off and smacking them and punching them, and they get to guess who did it. How long do you think that would go on before someone would be calling the authorities on what was happening at this place? Barbaric to treat someone like that, especially if he's the son of God. Indeed, they were smiting him smacking him. Now there was some years ago that I read in the paper, read actually not in the paper, I read on online magazine that was reporting current news that there were a couple of boys in Missouri who found a stray dog and they took their smartphones and engaged in very, very foolish and mean-spirited cruel behavior. They filmed each other basically torturing that dog, jumping up in the air and then landing with their full body weight on the dog as he lay on the ground and the dog would yelp. They pictured each other smacking and kicking the dog and spitting on the dog. How long do you think that stayed on YouTube before it got yanked? Not long. Friends, as shocked as we are by treating a dog that way. I want you to really plug into this. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, was slapped and smitten and, yes, spit upon. He was spit upon. How humiliating is that? You say, well, it doesn't hurt. Okay, if it doesn't hurt, is there anyone volunteering to be blindfolded and spit upon this night? No, such is absolutely humiliating to consider. And then there is this scoffing that goes on beneath the cross. If you'll go to Matthew chapter 27, I want you to see that in verse number 29, after they put a scarlet robe on him in verse 28, Oh, you're a king. Here's your royal apparel. Every king needs a crown. So they fashion a crown of thorns for him. And they put it on his head. And then they start pretending to bow before King Jesus. Oh, you're a king. Let's show our adoration to the king. And they then take the scepter that was supposedly his kingly scepter, that reed, that rod, and they start hitting him over the head with it. What does that do to that crown of jagged thorns? It drives them digging deeper into his scalp, into his scalp, and the head is the most vascular part of the body. It bleeds more profusely when injured than any other part of the body. And here is Jesus Christ. No wonder Isaiah said his visage is marred. He was beaten practically beyond recognition. When you take all the slapping and the smiting they did before this event and then they add on top of that a rod smacking him in the face and driving a crown of thorns deep into his scalp and then they get him to verse 31 after they'd mocked him, they took the robe off from him. How would that feel? 
rip the blood clotting elements off of his back, put another garment on him, his own raiment, lead him away to crucify him, get him there to the old rugged cross, rip that garment off of him, and now take a bloody raw beaten back, throw it down on an old piece of timber, and then take a cylindrical nail about yea long, find a weight bearing spot, and then take the hammer and drive through the flesh and bone and fasten Jesus to the cross, nail his feet to the cross, and now what? He can't find a comfortable position. If he slumps, oh, if he lifts up for life-giving breath, oh, he can't find a spot that's comfortable. And well, surely beneath the cross there are people encouraging him, saying, it's okay, it's all right, it's okay. Uh, what we read here in Matthew chapter 27 is this. In verse 39, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads to taunt him. And then they started saying things like, Aren't you the one that destroyed the temple? You were going to destroy the temple and build it back in three days. Didn't you say you were going to look at you? Yeah, I don't think you're going to be able to do that. And then you'll notice the, the chief priests are among the mockers. And they say, well, he saved others. Verse 42, he can't even save himself. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe him. Come down, come on. We'll believe you if you come down. The, uh, that's what we thought. King. Now, uh, let me ask you, friend, are you offended at the very thought of people standing beneath the cross of Jesus and mocking him like that? I hope you don't have any enemies. But if you do, can you even fathom for one second being barbaric enough if you found out that your enemy was in the local ICU unit? Can you imagine for one second trying to sneak your way in there when no one else was around so you could stand at the foot of their bed and say, how's it feel to be so helpless and powerless? Come on, suffer, die, look at you, look at you. Friends, you would be arrested so fast if you tried to do that to someone who lay in a dying condition in the hospital, there is the scoffing that goes on, how painful that must have been. But here's the most painful thing right here. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is Psalm 22 coming to reality in Matthew chapter 27, 46. Jesus Christ is feeling that sense of bearing the sins of the world, which God cannot fellowship at that moment in time. And your sins and mine are included in that which caused the separation. And so there is then this purpose of this death. I want you to note, friends, what is the purpose? It's the reading that you, you just had tonight. Here's the purpose. Are you ready? For Christ also hath once suffered. Yes, he did suffer. Four sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. That is why Jesus Christ died, to bring us to God, to save us. It is a saving sacrifice. But my friends, I want you to now see as we close out the pathway to get to this power. Now, I'm sure that if we were to stop at this point and say, would the religious world in general agree or disagree with what we've said about the cross of Christ tonight? Generally speaking, the conservative evangelical religious world would say, yep, you got it right on target. Jesus Christ had to die and bleed so that we could be saved. Most folks accept that much. And most folks would agree that what it is that saves us, what it is that brings us remission of sins is the blood. We know Hebrews 9.22 says without the shedding of blood there is no remission. And Hebrews 10.1-4 says the blood of bulls and goats couldn't give that remission. 
So what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. There we go. What is it that gives me remission of sins? Jesus said, it's his blood. But what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1.5 says we're washed or loosed from our sins in his own blood. And then what is it that purges my conscience so I don't have to feel guilty anymore? Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience? I don't have to feel guilty anymore because the blood has washed my sins away, purged my conscience, given me remission of sins. Let me pause right here and ask, when does all of this happen? Most folks in the religious world would agree with this chart to this point. What is it that gives us remission of sins, that washes away sins, that purges the conscience? It's the blood of Christ. The rub seems to be when that happens. Now, I'm lovingly going to say that the common thing you'll see in tracts and literature, and I see them in gas stations left in various places, in hospital waiting rooms and other places. I pick up other religious literature just to see what folks are saying. And generally, we all agree the cross is what saves us. But when? When does the blood of the Christ on the cross save us? And most of the religious information I read says, if you believe Jesus bled and died for you, repeat the following prayer. Ask him to come into your heart. Make him the Lord of your life and he will save you today. How many of you, by show of hands, have seen or heard that plan of salvation given? Yes, all over the room. We've seen it, haven't we? Now, if that really is the plan of salvation, where would you expect to find it? Wouldn't you expect to find that in here if that's really how God wants it done? So we go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And when the people cried out, what shall we do? Did Peter take advantage of this opportunity to say, every head bowed, all right? Everyone bow your head and say this prayer. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Do you read in Acts 2, the inspired apostle Peter leading the people who ask what to do in the sinner's prayer? Do you read that there, yes or no? And if you don't read it there, where does it come from? What do you read there? You read that an inspired preacher who was speaking as the Spirit gave him utterance said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Wait a minute. I thought the blood of Jesus is what gave me remission of sins. Well, that's what does it, but when does the blood do that? When penitent confessing believers are baptized for the remission of sins, that's when the blood is applied to those souls. And what can wash away my sins? Do you know that there was a man named Saul of Tarsus who saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, and in Acts 9, 6, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And God told him there in verse 6, Arise and go into the city and there in the city. Not here. I'm not going to tell you what to do right here. But there in the city thou shalt be told what thou must do. So we wait. Whatever he's told to do, he must do it. Jesus said he must. So we wait. And Ananias is then... Contacted by God, Acts 9, 11, he's told, you're going to go look for a man who is praying. Acts 9, 11, behold, he's praying. Look for the praying man. Can I submit to you lovingly, there's not a better opportunity for someone to be led in the sinner's prayer than someone that was in the midst of prayer when the inspired preacher got to him. Did the inspired preacher Ananias say, this is perfect, you just stay right where you are and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and make you the... Did he do that, yes or no? What did an inspired preacher tell a praying man to do? Get up.
Arise. Get up. You can't do what you need to do where you are, so you got to get up and be baptized for the remission of sins. No, he says to wash away your sins. Arise and be baptized and wash away. But isn't that equivalent to the remission of sins? Yes. It's the same thing. It's just worded differently. You can wash your sins away in the blood of Christ when you arise and are baptized as a penitent, confessing believer. And then, yes, 1 Peter 3.21 the Bible in the very same verse that was read about the cross of Christ, the just for the unjust, says baptism does something. Now I'm going to tell you about a door knocking that I did back in the 80s in Etowah, Tennessee. Maybe you've never heard of Etowah, Tennessee. Maybe you have. It's not about 60 miles from Knox, Knoxville and about 60 miles from Chattanooga, kind of sandwiched in between those two major cities. We were having a gospel meeting, so I went out door knocking with some of the brethren. Saw a man on his porch. He was nice. He invited me on up. And uh, he said, what do you got there? And I handed him the flyer, and it said, the Etowah Church of Christ, Athens Pike, gave the theme of the meeting, the speaker. And he said, no, young man, let me ask you something. Aren't you that group that teaches baptism's got something to do with saving us? And I said lovingly, and we should always be respectful and kind, even when we lovingly disagree, right? I said, well, sir, well, one thing we would really want known is that we believe the blood of Christ is what saves us, but when does it do it? And I started to go into the explanation. Now, I wasn't going to start with baptism, but I wasn't going to leave it out either. And so before I could even get that far, he stopped me. He said, young man, how old are you? I told him I was in my early 20s. He said, I've been reading my Bible more years than you've been alive. Do you know that? And let me tell you, in all the years I've been reading my Bible, I know this. There ain't no place in the Bible, I'm quoting him, there ain't no place in the Bible that comes right out and says baptism saves us. I'll tell you that much. And that's exactly the way he worded it. And he had a Bible within arm's reach. And I said, sir, I notice you have a Bible nearby. Do you believe the Bible? Oh, I believe every word of the Bible, young man. I said, that is fantastic. We need more people to believe every word of the Bible. I wonder, could I show you just one verse in the Bible? And he seemed a little reluctant, but I think he felt compelled. And so I said, well, would you locate 1 Peter 3 and, and verse 21? And he went there. And I watched his lips. He didn't read it out loud, but I could tell his lips kept reading one phrase over and over. And remember, he just said, there ain't no place in the Bible that comes right out and says baptism saves us. I'll tell you that much. And now he's reading the like figure whereunto even baptism does also now what? And I watched his lips and they were doing this. Baptism does all. Baptism does also now save us. And I just waited for it to sink in a little. And I said, sir, what does the inspired apostle Peter say that baptism does by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's what gives it its power. He said, well, and then he looks back down at his Bible and then looks up at me and he says, well, he says it saves us. But I don't believe it. And then he commanded me to get off of his porch. And I didn't leave with a hoo-hoo. I told him. I got him with the word of God. No. I literally left his porch with a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes. Because here's a man who just said, I believe every word of the Bible. But when shown the exact words of the Bible, he said, I see it, but I don't believe it. Friends, it's as simple as this as we close. Naaman's a great Old Testament example of what and when, but I'm going to change these words, what and when, and watch what they change to. Grace and faith is going to change the whole equation here. What is it that would give him the cleansing, the power of God? When would that happen? When he would go wash in Jordan seven times, he'd be clean. When, by the power of God, he would be given the blessing if he would go and wash in Jordan seven times. And you'll notice grace 
what God and only God could give. Naaman couldn't earn this. He was dependent on the favor, the unmerited favor of God toward him. And faith is him saying, all right, God, even if I don't comprehend why you want me to do such and such, if you want me to do such and such, I'll do such and such and trust you to do what you said you'd do if I do such and such. And so he finally in faith went and washed in the Jordan seven times. And how did that work for him? He was cleansed. Friends, the illustration as we close, the blood of Jesus Christ is the grace of God on exhibit. It's exhibit A of the grace and mercy and love of God. His son bleeding and dying for you is proof positive that he loves you. And in faith, you and I need to repent and be baptized if we haven't already for the remission of sins, to wash away our sins and to purge our conscience. I wonder if his death is powerful to you and if you'll take up your cross. I wonder, dear friends, if you've been back to the cross and have considered its meaning to you. And I, I don't want you to ever forget the power of the cross. But friends, I want to close with this because to me, this helps illustrate that power in an unforgettable way. When I was a student at Fried Hardeman, way back in the early 80s, we had a guest speaker in chapel, and I couldn't even tell you his name. I wasn't yet married and had no children, and so I was aware of the illustration, but never learned to appreciate it as much as I do now, having children and now a grandchild. This speaker told us of an occasion that happened, and by the way, I've been told on more than one occasion in places where I've mentioned this by people that were there that they were there when these things happened, and one of our students actually bought a used Bible, and he said, you'll never guess what I found tucked into this used Bible. He said, that story I've heard you tell about the young man it tells a newspaper article in this Bible that I bought that tells even more about it. And I, he gave me information I didn't even know about and have. But here's the story. Two boys in a dormitory on a Christian college campus decades ago, and Coke bottles were then thick glass. They weren't plastic. They were thick glass. And these boys are out in the hallway just horsing around, and throwing and skipping these bottles of glass down the carpeted hallway to see how far they could uh, get them distance contest. Who can throw the bottle the furthest without breaking it on the wall on either side? And they're just engaged in foolish horseplay. And then one of the guys takes his wrist and he cocks it and he gets his aim carefully and then he just lets that Coke bottle fly, and it is flying down that hall like a missile. And so far, so good. It's not touching the wall on either side. And a boy down the hall is stepping out into the hall, unaware of what he's stepping into. He steps out into the hall just... Shortly before, that Coke bottle slams into the side of his temple, and he crumples to the ground. They take him to Vanderbilt Hospital. He is actually later released that day from Vanderbilt Hospital, comes back and begins hemorrhaging and dies. He doesn't make it. Now, you're the boy that threw the bottle that killed a human being. And even though you never meant to do it, he's still dead. And his parents are going to be missing him, no matter your motive. He's gone. And you killed him. How do you make that right? I'm sorry? Well, sure. But is that going to fix it? The boy is expelled from school. Time goes by. He's informed that the parents of the boy that you killed would like to meet with you. 
How do you prepare for that meeting? How many times, how many ways can you say I'm sorry and make it all better when someone's still missing their loved one that you killed through your horseplay? He's already anticipating what they could unload on him and say. I mean, think about it. Our son will not get to graduate from college, though you someday will somewhere, whether this college or someone else. You can still get your diploma, but we'll never watch him graduate. You know what else we won't do? We won't see him standing at the front of a church building waiting expectantly for his bride to come around the corner and come marching down the aisle to him so they can begin their, begin their married life and have their children, which would, by the way, young man, be our grandchildren. Do you know that that's the only child we had and you took not just him, but you took our grandchildren possibility with it? Thank you very much. How do you sleep at night? I deserve that. If that's what they say, I deserve that. But that's not what they say. The father speaks up and he says, We know that you didn't mean to kill our son. We know you didn't do it on purpose, and you would never have done it on purpose. We know that. We miss our son. We can't replace him. We know. But we know something else. We've been informed that when you became a member of the church you read about in the New Testament, that your family disowned you and said, because of your decision, you weren't welcome home anymore until you repudiated the faith that you embraced when you became a Christian. And we know that your conscience won't let you leave the one church you read about in the Bible. And so we know you don't have a family and we don't have a son. So my wife and I have talked about it and prayed about it. And we came here today to invite you to become ours. We'd like to adopt you as our own and treat you as our own son. And if you want to come home for Thanksgiving turkey, you've got a place. If you want to come home for the December holidays and just enjoy some relaxing time with a family atmosphere, we'll be your family. You've got a place. Could you do that? To the same guy that killed your Flesh and blood, could you adopt him and treat him as a son? I'd like to think I could. They did. And I'm told by those who know and have seen it that in years to come thereafter, if you went to the house where these boys had lived, there was a picture over the mantle of the boy who died and there was a picture over the mantle of the boy who threw the coke bottle that killed him. But these parents put both of those pictures up there above the mantle and claimed them both as their sons. No wonder it's called amazing grace. And I'm here tonight to offer you the Lord's invitation, not my own. And God the Father is essentially saying to you and to me, you killed my son through your sinfulness. That's why he had to die. And yet you know what? In spite of the fact that you're responsible in part for killing my son, I want you to become my son. I want to adopt you. Talk about a powerful death. A death powerful enough to adopt us into the family of the very one that we killed. How grateful I am to God. He arose. He ascended. He wants you to be his. He bled so you could. We're about to sing the invitation song. Never forget the power of one death. The death of Jesus Christ that gives you and gives me life and eternal life. Won't you please in obedience, respond to that gospel call right now as together we stand and as we sing. Won't you please?